Well, good morning. Oh, I know it's a little warm in here. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to begin by introducing the folks who've joined us here today, uh, beginning, of course, with our Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll. We have Dr. Gerald Gabot, who is the founder and executive director of the Immigrant Family Services Institute, IFSI. John Yaswinski, who is president and CEO of Father Bills and Mainspring. Reverend Katie Cole, pastor at the Hartford Street Presbyterian Church in Natick. Lenita Reason, executive director of the Brazilian Workers Center. Joining us as well, our Secretary of Housing and Livable Communities, Ed Augustus. Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kate Walsh. Susan Church, Chief Operating Officer of our Office of Refugees and Immigrants. Boston City Councilor, Ruth C. Louisiane. President and CEO, Lee Pelton of the Boston Foundation. President and CEO, Bob Janino, United Way of Mass Bay. Father Hare of the Archdiocese of Boston. Iman Abdul Kabir Farah of the Islamic Society of the Boston Cultural Center, Rabbi Danny Berkman of Temple Sher Tivka in Wayland. These are leaders from our administration as well as local government, the faith community, immigrant service providers, family shelter operators, and the philanthropic community. We're here today together to make an important announcement. As of today, close to 5,600 families with children are living in state-funded shelters, hotels, dorms, and other emergency facilities across Massachusetts. That figure is 80% higher than it was just one year ago. It represents more than 20,000 people growing every day. These families include newborns, very young children, and expecting mothers. It's more families than our state has ever served, exponentially more than our state has ever served in our emergency assistance program. These numbers are being driven by a surge of new arrivals in our country who've been through some of the hardest journeys imaginable. They are the face of the national, international migrant crisis. They're here because where they came from is too dangerous to stay. They're here because Massachusetts has and will always be a beacon of hope, compassion, humanity, and opportunity. They're here because like any of us, they would do anything, endure any hardship to protect and support the people they love, especially their children. Massachusetts has met these families with compassion and resourcefulness. State, nonprofit, community partners have been working around the clock for months, standing up thousands of new shelter units, family welcome centers in Alston and Quincy, new shelter sites at Joint Base Cape Cod, where we recently activated 50 National Guard members, as well as more recently, Eastern Nazarene College and dozens of hotels. We created a new legal services program for immigrants, the first of its kind in the United States. We are going to keep doing everything that we can to help families in need. We remain unwavering in our commitment to being a state and a people of compassion, safety, opportunity, and respect. But the increased level of demand is not slowing down. And due to both a longstanding shortage of affordable housing, as well as delays and barriers to federal work authorizations, we find ourselves in this situation. We're unable to move people from housing and shelter into permanent housing because of this. So instead, we've been expanding and continuing to look for housing and shelter opportunities, expanding shelter at a rapid pace, and it's unsustainable. For this reason, today I am declaring a state of emergency in Massachusetts. What this means is as follows. I am directing members of my administration to continue to utilize and operationalize all means necessary to secure housing, shelter, health and human services to address this humanitarian crisis. I am asking all of our partners from government and the faith community 
philanthropic organization, organizations, human service providers, businesses, and residents across this great state to come together and do whatever you can to help us and to help these families to meet this moment. And critically, I am delivering an urgent and formal appeal to the federal government for intervention and action. We need action to remove barriers and expedite federal work authorizations. We need action and intervention for funding to help us in this time. The truth is, our new arrivals are most eager to work. The last thing they want to do is be dependent. And we could frankly use their help at this time. Our state, as so many states are, is encountering significant labor shortages. But unfortunately, we're seeing wait times for work authorizations stretching from several months to several years and longer. Just Friday, the Lieutenant Governor and I visited a temporary shelter site at Salem State College. I want to thank our University President John Keenan, who is here with us today, uh, Mayor Pangalo and the Salem community for being such willing partners, providing a comfortable, welcoming space for families. There at Salem State, we met with the outstanding staff from Center Board, a Lynn-based organization that's providing 24-hour wraparound services to the families there. We also had a chance to speak with some of those families. We met a father of two young children, originally from Haiti, a certified welder. Without prompting, in fact, he reached into his pocket and proudly pulled out his welder's license and asked us to put him to work. He communicated with us in Spanish as he learned that language during his journey here through Central and South America. His story is emblematic of so many stories. He wants desperately to get to work in our country. He wants to practice his trade. He wants to support his family. We met another migrant, a gentleman, a farmer from Haiti, who's a tuck truck driver, certified and licensed in Haiti, a mom from the Dominican Republic, a woman from Algeria who used to be, her, used to be a French teacher and would like to teach again. These were just some of the very first people we bumped into outside the shelter on campus. They all wanted to work. They are all right now eagerly taking English classes that are being provided on site. They're exactly the kind of hardworking, resilient, resourceful, enterprising newcomers who have always been the engine of America's success. They're assets who can enrich our culture and strengthen our economy. And communities across Massachusetts are proving once again that the opening of doors of opportunity to people seeking a better life is our oldest and deepest civic value. In the city of Greenfield, there was such an outpouring of support for migrant families staying at a local hotel that officials had to put a pause on donations. The Mesa Verde restaurant opened on a Sunday and shelter residents prepared and cooked a large community meal with recipes from their home country as a way to show their appreciation to local volunteers. We thank Mayor Roxanne Wiedegartner, Senator Joe Comerford, Rep. Natalie Blay, Rep. Susanna Whips for their leadership in setting such a welcoming tone. In Concord, where a temporary hotel site opened in March, the public schools welcomed children with open arms. The message that Superintendent Lori Hunter shared with the community is a model of Massachusetts values. She wrote, quote, every family, despite the circumstances, brought a smile and deep care and concern for their child's well-being. We thrived off of their resilience and strength. 
These communities and many others are demonstrating why I believe Massachusetts can and will meet this moment. We are a state of compassionate people and we welcome more communities to step forward. We have caring and expert service providers and I cannot thank enough the staff represented here and I see you in the audience who do this work day in and day out. We have a congressional delegation that advances our values and advocates for our needs. We need all of Congress to follow the, their lead and support long overdue immigration reform, the kind that President Biden has proposed. This is a national issue that demands a national response. In the meantime, we're simply asking the federal government to use the tools already available to give these brave parents a chance to work and to support their families. At the same time, we're calling on everyone in Massachusetts to come together, help us meet this moment in our state, and offer a helping hand. That's all that we would ask if it were our family. In most cases, and some uh, in, the, in the past, we know for, for us, it's been our own family members who've arrived on these shores. When we look into the faces of migrant moms and dads and children, we should recognize the hope, the courage of those who built our state and made our own lives possible. And we must realize that these are also qualities and the people who will help build our future. I now invite Lieutenant Governor Driscoll to say more about how you can help. Thank you, Governor. This is truly an all hands on deck moment. And as the governor said, Massachusetts is already showing how it steps up in these moments. We're Massachusetts. In times of strife, we don't turn on people, we turn towards people. We come together in times like these and draw strength from each other to meet any crisis, whether it was the marathon bombing or the COVID pandemic. Right now, we're dealing with a humanitarian crisis. It has national and global origins, but we're seeing the face of it right here. True to our values, we will step up and lean into this opportunity to help those in need. I'm the daughter of an immigrant and believe, as the governor said, new arrivals bring tremendous qualities of courage and resilience to our Commonwealth. They are here, like so many before them, seeking a better life for their families. But the fact is, with the current surge, this is not a crisis that our family shelter system was designed to handle. For months now, state government and our providers have been doing the work of stretching the system as far as it can safely go. But we really need to bring more people into this work to make it a true team effort. It's time that we have our Commonwealth's values, our shared values, now more than ever, we need shared and collective action to achieve those. That's why we're declaring this state of emergency, making this urgent appeal to the federal government for partnership, and asking everyone, individuals, nonprofits, communities, faith organizations, the private sector, to step up and help us be a part of this solution. Momentum has already started building. The governor and I have been on calls in recent days and weeks with folks you see on this stage and in this room, along with many, many others. And our most recent calls have come a new opportunity to recognize the generosity of the people here in the Commonwealth. And today, we're pleased to announce the Massachusetts Migrant Families Relief Fund, created by the Boston Foundation and administered by the United Way of Massachusetts Bay. We can also announce two major initial donations, Eastern Bank has pledged the first major donation of $100,000. CEO Nancy Stager of the Eastern Bank Foundation is here with us. Thank you so much. Eastern always steps up. And Blue Cross Blue Shield has pledged $50,000 to help support this effort. This fund just got stood up today. We've already got two major donors. We know there are others out there who can, who can help provide some relief. This fund can help us deliver emergency financial assistance so that children and families have access to essential needs, including food and shelter, clothing, diapers, hygiene items, and transportation. It will help fund screenings and translation services, legal assistance, work authorizations, job training, ESOL classes, and other socioeconomic 
and cultural integration supports. It will utilize a network of trusted human service organizations to undertake this work. We have a lot of the infrastructure in place. We need to connect it and get it organized. It will support the local community-based organizations providing direct services already. This will help stretch budgets and staff resources. We're extremely grateful to the Boston Foundation and the United Way. I know Lee Pelton is here uh, and, and Bob from United Way is here for stepping up so quickly to make the Migrant Relief Fund a reality and certainly to have two initial donors already to help kick things off is the Massachusetts way. And as great as this fund is, it's not the only way to help. There are lots more ways you can help in addition to supporting the fund directly. You can donate basic necessities and supplies at our family welcome centers in Alston and Quincy. You can get connected at a local shelter site. We are in over 80 communities. Shelter sites are in place from Springfield to Cape Cod. We need donations of time, helping with meals, tending to occupants' needs, assistance with kids. Folks are living in small spaces. Gift cards for any sort of grocery or pharmacy are always welcome. Most importantly, if you have an extra room or suite in your home, please consider hosting a family. Safe housing and shelter is our most pressing need. Become a sponsor family. You can contact the Brazilian Worker Center for more information on how you can step up if you're willing to have an additional family be part of your family. If you're a local official, a college president, a business owner, or a faith leader with an available building or space in your community, please work with us to offer it as a shelter site. If you're a social service provider, please consider becoming an emergency assistance homeless shelter provider. Our resources are stretched thin there as well. And if you're a hotel or a motel owner, consider opening it up for emergency assistance. If you're a landlord or a property owner, we can use you too. We can connect you with service providers to help transition families into permanent housing. Everyone has something they can offer, and frankly, no act is too small. You can go to mass.gov slash shelter crisis. Again, that's mass.gov slash shelter crisis to learn more about how we can work together to meet this moment. You can also email anyone who's got thoughts or ideas or something that they think they can provide to assist us. You can email us at shelterhelp at mass.gov, or you can dial our 211 system. We've got MEMA connected and ramped up to help with recognizing these opportunities, sourcing them, and taking triage as part of our state's response. Like, there is no doubt this is a serious crisis. We have families in real need in a system that is under stress. But we also have no doubt that Massachusetts will rise to meet this moment. We've done it time and again. We're a state that's used to leading and coming together in service for a greater good. The governor and I are committed to doing all that we can to address this current humanitarian crisis, and we're counting on the people of our Commonwealth to join with us in this effort. I'd like to invite Dr. Gabo, the founder and executive director of the Immigrant Family Services Institute, affectionately known as IFSI, uh, to share her perspective. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is such an honor for me to be here this morning with three wonderful individuals that I brought with me. And I always said when we are talking about the immigrant, uh, immigration crisis or housing crisis, we forget that we are talking about a real human being. And just to testify of you know, who we are talking about today, I brought those three wonderful people, Jerry, uh, Prival, and then Esther. Esther was a pregnant woman when she was uh, caught off at Del Rio River under the bridge. And Esther had to be washed to the hospital to deliver her baby. And Esther was desperate. She didn't know exactly what to do. She thought that all was lost. And as soon as we met with Esther to our one-stop service center, we were able to help Esther with her baby her family get access to all of the services in one place, providing them with access to job and getting her work permit. And now Esther, her husband, they are all working, making wonderful contribution to our community. Yes. Johnny Preval is a technician. So he left Haiti with his construction skill set went to Brazil, worked for a while, and then decided to take the long journey to come here. When uh, Johnny came, Johnny 
again, as so many of them, they didn't know what to expect. But as soon as Johnny came in touch with us, we helped Johnny with everything. Johnny now called us his family. He believed that he left his family behind. Now he is welcomed by a new family at IFC. And Johnny was working at the airport, believe it or not, as in service operator. And now he's working with also with Amazon, putting his skill set toward our community. So let's welcome Johnny. <laughs> we have Jerry. Jerry is an entrepreneur. He loves touching everything. The minute that Jerry came in touch with us, he wanted to help. He volunteered his time at IFC day in and day out until he was able to receive his work authorization to go to work at Northeastern, helping with the cafeteria. Jerry is helping now the new arrival, guiding them, helping them to know where they, where they need to go, helping them take a ride to take them to their appointment. And now Jerry is with us at IFC with our uh, IT department, helping, welcoming our new families. Again, let's welcome Jerry. So I want to, I wanted to share those stories with you to say that the new uh, families who are coming to our communities are wonderful human beings. We did a survey in terms of you know, those who are coming in terms of their age range. We realized they are between 19 and 34. 19 and 34, meaning that they are ready to work, as the governor said. They are ready to contribute to our economy. They are ready to make us better. They are ready to make us stronger. And one thing that I always said, you know, People asking me, why are you so passionate about you know, helping immigrate all the time? And I said, after all they've gone through, risking their lives, taking this long journey, sometimes carrying their be uh, belongings on their shoulders, having their children on, in their back, pregnant women walking day in and day out for hours just to make it here because they believe that by coming here, something will change. Something will be better. And I said, it is our duty. It is our duty to stand behind what they believe, which means that we are a welcoming community. We are people who honor those who risk their lives to make it here. And the least we can do is to do everything in our power to serve them and to welcome them. So today, I joined the governor. I joined the uh, uh, LG in terms of declaring this state of emergency so that all of us can come together. All of us, no exception, whether or not you are an individual, a church leader, a community-based leader, at the city, the state, elected official, federal, all of you, you can play a role in welcoming those individuals because they are bringing so much more. That's what we call the right investment. We need to be really, really intelligent. By investing in them, we are investing in the future of our community. They are teachers, they are drivers, they work in the nursing room, they work in the hospital. They are all over the place making us uh, uh, better. So I call them my heroes because when we look at what they've gone through to where they are now, and still they want to help, still they want to contribute, still they want to bring their skills, their language, their culture, their, their food, I call them my heroes. And that's the reason why I have no doubt that Massachusetts will rise to the occasion. We have done it in the past. We can do it today, and we will do it. This is unprecedented time that requires unprecedented solution. We need all of you to come together so we can make our state, our commonwealth, the leader of welcoming immigrants with love, compassion, and dignity. Thank you so much. Doctor, you're a hero of mine. Unbelievable. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Governor Healy, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, Secretary Augustus, and Secretary Walsh. Under your leadership, Massachusetts has done a tremendous job 
responding to this unprecedented need for emergency shelter. Our state has done the right thing, treating families with the dignity and respect that they deserve. Families have continued to struggle with high cost of housing and inflation through the past several years. And as part of our mission, Father Bills in Mainspring and many of the other providers in the shelter believe that nobody should be homeless, no matter where you are from or the language you speak. That's why nearly a year ago, Father Bills stepped up to help lead the sheltering operations at Joint Base Cape Cod to support the nearly 50 Venezuela migrants who were flown to Martha's Vineyard. Over the past year, as the demand for shelter continued to rise, family shelter providers have done an amazing job of bringing over thousands of shelter units with the state's help. But the demand continues. And now we need a change in approach. If we're going to meet the unique and varied needs of our both extremely low-income Massachusetts residents, as well as our newly arriving families, this is why we are grateful to be here today, to support the governor's call for all hands on deck. One example is that is the parents that are in our shelter programs now. They are ready and willing to work today. If you are an employer and you have job opportunities, please connect with the state's work programs and with our shelter providers to see if you can help our families get jobs, our parents, and move out of the shelter. Every day, we also see so many families that we can and should be able to prevent from becoming homeless. I ask all the landlords, all the communities, to work with our programs to preserve the tenancies. We ask all the advocacy groups, the faith groups, the philanthropy, volunteers, and concerned neighbors to unite around this crisis. Every one of us can play a role. I would also like to recognize all the state workers, especially from our health and human services and our housing programs, for your long hours and commitment to helping our shelter providers and to all the shelter frontline workers. Thank you for your hard work and compassion. Thank you again to the governor, the lieutenant governor, and your administration for listening and including the agencies on the front lines in this fight. Governor, as you said the other night on a call, we must all meet this moment. We are meeting it today. Thank you. My name is Reverend Katie Cole, and I am the interim pastor at Hartford Street Presbyterian Church in Natick. And two months ago, I preached a sermon to my congregation about how can we be more welcoming. We had just crafted a new mission statement and decided that being welcoming was one of our core values. So that seemed like a good thing to preach about. And so I preached to my congregation, but also to our sister Brazilian congregation that worships with us. And I asked two congregations to earnestly pray, how can we be more welcoming? I had no particular agenda in mind at the time of preaching that sermon. And not even 12 hours later, I got a phone call from a colleague at the Commonwealth saying, who do you know that could host families? Because we are in a crisis, and honestly, to address this and address it well, we need to be bold and creative and think outside the box. So who do you know and what can you do? Now, I do believe that God hears our prayers and answers them, but usually it's God's time and not within 12 hours and by a phone call. <laughs> and so, but that, that ask is too big for just one person to unilaterally decide on her own. So I asked for help and we had a board meeting scheduled that week anyway. So I called my leaders and said, do you think this is something that we can do? And some of my leaders said, yes, absolutely. This is scriptural, this is in our tradition, this is in our values, like let's go, when can we start? And some of my leaders said, yes, I have questions. Have, you, have we thought this through? What about this, what about this, what about this? 
And that mix of unbridled enthusiasm and really good logistical thinking, that together on our team helped us decide to say yes. But we didn't give ourselves a start date because we weren't sure how long it would take to actually be able to host families. And again, this request was too big for one person to take on all by herself, so I called for help and I reached out to my colleagues in Natick, my clergy colleagues. And many of them had done work like this before, but for very good reasons weren't able to serve families this way at this time. But they pledged support to us even before we said we were gonna do this. And so I'm gonna miss people's names, but with Temple Israel Natick, Shechem and Natick, Pilgrim Church in Sherburn, Elliott Church, uh, First Congregational Church in Natick, A Place to Turn, Project Just Because, and many, many more. With all of their help and support, we were able to get everything we needed in three days, and we hosted our first family a few days later. We have served 11 families this summer, and as I have gotten to meet the kids, once they are in a safe place, they are fun and bright and creative, and they will make excellent students in our classrooms. And their parents are driven and earnest and generous, and they will make such good neighbors for the communities that they bless. And as families have left staying with us and continued on their journey, uh, they have all given us some variation of the same blessing over and over again. And it's something like this. First, we do not know how we will ever thank you enough. Followed by, God bless your congregation and you and your family and your friends and everyone you know and everyone you meet. So it is nice to meet you all today because I hope you now receive that blessing from these families. That this is a really complicated situation, but it is solvable. This situation is too big for any one person or one agency or one system or one municipality to tackle by ourselves. But if we bring this together, if we show up together and offer what we have with a spirit of joy and I don't know, we'll see what works, if we do that, we can ease this burden and enjoy the blessing that this really is. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Lenita Reason. I am executive director at the Brazilian Worker Center. I am an immigrant from Brazil and I have been here for 16 years. The Brazilian Worker Center is honored to be the first welcome center um, in Massachusetts. We have been doing this work for almost two, two months and it has been um, a blessing. Everybody saying it's a Christ, it's chaotic, but for us it's a blessing. Every day when we close our doors and we know that the families that could be sleeping at the street or could be sleeping at emergency room, have a bed, have food, have a warm shower, that means a lot for us. And I know that means a lot for them. And that's why we are very grateful for, for the administration of Governor Healy, uh, Lituan Driscoll, and all her team that has been work with us seven days a week. That is not like the center opens at 10 and close at eight, no. <laughs> at 6 a.m. we have Allison call. We have Valentina at 10 p.m. We have um, Susan all day uh, checking in. So we are work 24 seven, but the families are so grateful for that the young children, the pregnant women that comes and feel welcome. I have been called on the street in the past and people had told me to go back to my country. So I know what means not be uh, welcome. So that's why I do my best and my team that the, does the best to welcome everyone that comes to our door. So I, I, I say all the time, if you're not a Native American, you came from somewhere. 
and you was welcome here before. So it's our duty to welcome the ones that comes after us. I wasn't documented before, not because I want to, but because the system took so long. So that's why now and today we are asking the federal administration to speed up the process and make people be able to work and provide for themselves. So we have the duty to welcome these families and make sure that we value what they bring with them. So at the, the Brazilian Worker Center now, we say we speak Spanglish, we speak Portuguese. <laughs> Every day we learn something in French or in Haitian. So they have a lot to teach to us. And we are learn with each other. We have uh, someone that came to, to our office like five times because it was like a circle, come to us, go to DTA, find a place to stay until he, was, he and his family was placed. His name is Roberto. He can't stop. He work all the time. He wants to help everyone all the time. And he's so, he's a, he's a gentleman. He's polite. He speaks Spanish and Haitian, but he's already saying something Portuguese, something English, so I know he's gonna learn uh, Portuguese fast and that we will learn uh, Spanish or Haitian. And he's there with his soul and his politeness, is smiling every day and, and be thankful for the opportunity. And he's only volunteer. He's volunteering because we welcome them and him and his families. So his wife came and did the hair or other people that was there. And he came and said, I'm gonna be volunteer here until I get my papers. So this is where Dr. Gabal, uh, Governor Hill say everybody can help. Everybody can do their part. So everyone can do it. I received an email from a mom that said that her son is turning 13 soon, and what he wants for his birth is invite his, his friends to make uh, birthday bags with some crayons and some other stuff to bring to the kids. So this is someone that only saw uh, an, an article at the newspaper and felt that he have something to do, so everybody can do something, and that's why we're here today. Um, and I am, me and my team, we have been witness every day what everybody has heard here today. And we haven't seen over 500 families in a month. We saw 45 families at one 143 individuals in a day. And this was like six hours in between. And everybody was welcoming. Everybody had something to eat. Everybody had provide um, the, the, what they was needed at the moment and sent to a place that was safe. So it's been a lot but it's been doable. When people want to do it and when we have administration that support us they encourage us and fight with us and not be just here at our house, but right there in a community where things are happening. We can do it and we can do it together. And I will continue my commitment and the commitment of the Brazilian Workers Center every day to help in partnership with the state to ensure that all migrants that comes to us we receive the necessary support and the resource so they can begin their new lives and provide for themselves and support the state. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you so much to all of the speakers uh, who are here today. And again, thank you to all of our partners, both represented here on the stage, out in the audience and outside of this building who are working and I know will continue to work so hard on these issues. At this time, I'd like to take questions. Uh, 
we're declaring an emergency here in the state because there is an emergency here in the state. The numbers that we're seeing of individuals, of families who are coming uh, into our state is unprecedented. That, of course, already on top of a number of families here who've been here who are experiencing housing insecurity. So that's why we're declaring an emergency. The emergency will allow me to do whatever is necessary to assist with the situation. I mentioned um, that our administration has and will continue to look to utilize and operationalize all means to secure housing, shelter, food, health, and human services. It is also important, though, that this be issued so that the federal government, our federal partners, the federal administration act in the way we need them to act. And other go governors have made this call. Um, I am making this call because there are two things that we need. Number one, we need expedited work authorizations. As you heard time and time again, and I welcome and invite any of you to spend time with migrants, talk to them, hear their stories. You will understand why it is absolutely not only imperative, but also good for Massachusetts to work to secure expedited work authorizations as quickly as possible. We need that from the federal government. We also need funding. We've talked about capacity. We are, we are reaching capacity here. Capacity continues to expand each day. That's one of the calls for action here. We're turning to the private sector, to private residents, to the faith community, to open your homes, your churches, your temples, your synagogues, your, your congregations, um, and to others out there who might have building space available to house families. But we also need additional funding and support from the federal government. So this is done as a matter of necessity. And again, we'll take whatever actions necessary to uh, secure resources here in the state. But the call today is for action and resources from the federal government. So Well, most importantly, I think right now is actually expedited work authorization. Unfortunately, we uh, find ourselves in a situation where Congress uh, has simply failed to act, failed to heed the call of the Biden administration uh, to enact the kind of immigration reform that would be most beneficial to our country, our economy, and so forth. So in the face of that, and notwithstanding the incredible efforts of our own congressional delegation who day in and day out are advocating and working on immigration reform, we do need action from the federal government and the federal administration in terms of expediting work authorizations. People are anxious to work. We know there are employers around this state, across industries, who are looking for that workforce. It's also a talented workforce. Not only is it a resilient workforce, coming with skills, training, licensing, certification from other countries, you understand something, too, uh, more today about the language capabilities. I was very struck in meeting uh, migrants who happened to be from Haiti originally, their proficiency in Spanish. And we know here in the Commonwealth the need for greater cultural competencies across uh, industries is, is certainly great. And so. Uh, our call is for federal funding um, as well as, as work authorizations, and to that end, we'll take it through any means possible. Well, I think that we've had wonderful partnerships with the more than 80 communities that we're in. This is a hard situation. It's a challenging situation. Just to give you an estimate, in the last 48 hours, we had to place 50 families, 50 families. Um, and that's uh, many, many individuals, of course, including young people with those 50 families. And so we don't get a lot of notice as people arrive here, often are flown in to Logan Airport. So we're working as best as we can with communication, with collaboration. Uh, but certainly that is part of this effort today. Uh, we want to include as many people in po as possible in efforts to help relieve some of the strains that our communities are facing right now. Uh, but I do want to acknowledge and, and appreciate the fact that so many communities have stepped up and residents within communities have stepped up. 
and we will continue to work to make sure that we have that communication and ongoing collaboration with our mayors and town managers, uh, elected officials in places all across Massachusetts. No, I was never going to end, nor do I have the authority to end right to shelter in the state. I do um, want to make clear, and that part of what this is about is to be very clear with the great people of Massachusetts that we are reaching capacity and that we need to figure out innovations and alternatives to deal with what really is a humanitarian crisis, a geopolitical crisis, and one that does not seem um, to abate. And while we will continue to work with our amazing partners here, the Lieutenant Governor outlined the various ways that people, organizations, businesses, philanthropy can get involved. There is something for everyone in the menu of options for help and assistance. We also are clear that we are calling on the federal government, federal administration, and federal partners to give us the tools and the resources to do what we need to do, for the health and safety and well-being of families and residents in our state, for our economy, and that's uh, what I hope uh, I hope we see. I can't make predictions about that. We'll do whatever is necessary. Well, you'll hear more about the budget soon. Uh, I am proud of the many investments that are in that budget uh, that our administration put forth, that the House and Senate put forth and supported. There are historic levels of investment in housing. Uh, I will also say that what we are experiencing here in Massachusetts in terms of the number, in terms of the regular and daily, and we will have between 10 and 20 families, 30 families arriving in Massachusetts today for whom we're gonna need to find housing. That is the reality of this moment. So we're not operating within structures or systems that contemplated or were built for this moment. And that's why the federal support is absolutely necessary. We are absolutely seeking federal assistance uh, in, the, in terms of funding. Importantly, and I really underscore this, it is about work authorizations. The number of people that we have met and spent time with in hotels and shelters here in communities around the state some have been waiting not weeks, not months, but a couple of years just, just to get a work authorization from the federal government. There is a means, there is historical precedent, uh, precedent for the federal government giving authorizations incident to parole or other, uh, other forms of, of uh, asylum or parole. There, there's, there's different ways they can go. And we just ask for that so that we all collectively can better get to where we need to be. We'll make, these are fabulous organizations who are well-trained, well-skilled in working as service providers. And again, I have seen the great people of the state. I have seen them step up in moments of trial and crisis, whether it was the Boston Marathon, whether it was the ongoing work to combat substance use disorder and the opioid crisis in our communities, or whether it's in this moment where we confront real, real need. My confidence always is on the people of Massachusetts. You have a team that's situated to work and do something that we haven't had to do before. But I know that though we haven't had to do this before, I know the will, the heart, the compassion, the brains of the people collectively represented in this effort will figure out the way forward. I am clear though, we need help from the federal administration. Sorry. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, and we are going to look to continue to expand because while we are grateful for the work of both the Brazilian Workers' Center, La Collaborativa, IFSI, so many others, what you are hearing today is that they can't, we can't go, go it alone. So. 
The reminder is to visit uh, the, the page. You can visit mass.gov slash shelter uh, fund. And you can also uh, look on that page for various ways to contribute. The story that Lenita told of the young boy, 13 years old, thinking about ways to work with his friends. If an eighth grader can do it, so can many, many more people across Massachusetts. Thank you very much.